that physicians and hospitals receive when they're giving medications in their practices. Very complex topic with a lot of moving parts, and so we thought that we would bring together the experts um, and our partners, Avalier, to help really walk us through what is this proposed rule, what does the demonstration really mean, what are some of the implications that patients might see, and how we might all work together to make sure that we do elevate the patient voice in the appropriate way. So joining me today is Fazia Hussein, who is the Senior Vice President of Reimbursement and Market Access at Avalier. And Fazia has had a long and rich really, er, um, experience career in the healthcare field doing a number of things and is really an expert, as far as I'm concerned, in my opportunity to work with her around all of the life sciences, around reimbursement, really understanding how the healthcare system works and how patients are seen um, throughout that healthcare system. So we're really lucky to have um, Fazia here with us today to, to share some of her thinking. Also with Fazia is Josh Seidman, who is the Senior Vice President of Payment and Delivery Innovation at Avalier. And really, Josh's expertise is all about the patient. So we're, again, really excited to have him here with us today where he will be able to really break down the proposed rule and help us really understand how that will um, impact the patient. And for those of you who are on Twitter, Josh will also tweet back at you if you will send uh, him a message. He's an, av an avid tweeter. So just one little piece of housekeeping, actually two pieces of housekeeping. Number one is what you see in front of you. If you have a question, you can please ask that question by typing it into the text field at the bottom right of your screen. We will be looking at the questions as we go through. We will interrupt where appropriate. Otherwise, we will get to the questions at the end of the presentation here today. If we don't get to you today, we will send you an email after the, um, the event. You will also receive an email after the event with a, a little brief evaluation, so we would love to, to hear from you um, on that as well. So with that, I am going to turn um, the microphone over to Fazia. Great. Linda, thank you for having us. Josh and I are excited to talk to you about the Part B payment demonstration, the proposal, and really what does it mean for patients. So we're going to start today with a grounding in terms of where the healthcare system has been and where it's going. We'll talk about the key components of the proposal and really start to drill into the patient voice and where is there an opportunity to elevate the patient perspective as we see this continued focus on value. So as many of you know, the U.S. healthcare system is continuing to shift from a volume-based to a value-based environment. The shift is really driven by a need to contain rising costs while maintaining or improving patient outcomes. This is an area that CMS has a long-standing focus in. Since the late 90s, we've seen CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which adjudicates the Medicare program, focus in on pay for reporting and pay for performance programs. And you'll see here on this slide, this is just a sample representation of some of the areas where the agency has been focused historically. But what we see as we move to the post-ACA environment, so after the Affordable Care Act was implemented and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, Innovation were founded, that we have seen an acceleration, a greater focus by CMS in alternative payment models. And these are models that you can see here on this slide, such as accountable care organizations, patient-centered medical homes, as well as disease-specific models, such as the Come Home model, which focuses in on enhancing oncology care delivery. We see here that CMS's commitment has been founded and inspiring to the private sector as well. We've seen Medicare make a public commitment to moving payments within the Medicare fee-for-service program to value-based payments. Specifically, as we think about enrollment of providers within alternative payment models that reward and incentivize healthcare outcomes while also reducing overall healthcare expenditures. We also see that Medicare, beginning in 2019, is going to be providing incentive payments for providers to participate in these alternative payment um, models. The commercial Commitment is just as strong, where we see organizations such as the Healthcare Transformation Task Force, which includes a number of different payers such as Aetna, providers, purchasers, and thought leaders, also committed to putting 75% of their business within alternative payment models by 2020. 
key learning here is that regardless of the type of models that are tested, it's important to have the framing that we are moving towards a value-based environment that will continue to focus on cost containment while improving and maintaining quality for patients. So as we talk to you about the Part B payment model, we want you to have the broader vision as to what does this new environment mean for patients and care delivery. So we think about the Part B model, it's important to understand that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which is really the authority under which CMS is proposing to execute this demonstration, is charged with testing models that improve quality without harming costs, they decrease costs without harming quality, or decrease costs and improve quality. These three key points are very important because these are the core criteria that CMMI uses as it assesses the expansion of model testing. What's really unique here in terms of the Part B payment uh, proposal, this is a mandatory nationwide proposal that has not been tested previously in smaller geographies. And this is also one, because it's mandatory, providers who are placed into this demonstration must participate. Previously, models were tested on a smaller scale in select geographies with voluntary participants. This raises some new dynamics in terms of CMMI authority, which is likely to be an area of focus for many stakeholders um, in the coming days as we think through comments and the future of the demonstration. With that, let's dig into the core components of the Part B payment uh, demonstration. This proposal was released by Medicare in early March, and it really seeks to test the hypothesis that alternative payment designs would lead to both higher quality and more affordable care for Part B enrollees and also reduce Medicare expenditures. And CMS seeks to make these changes in two phases. Phase one, which is anticipated to begin this fall, but no earlier than 60 days after the rule is finalized, really is more of a payment adjustment in phase one, Medicare is seeking to adjust the payment for Part B drugs to an ASP or average sales price plus 2.5% add-on percentage and a flat fee per administration day. This is a shift from the current reimbursement methodology in which Medicare reimburses um, Part B covered drugs under an ASP or an average sales price plus 6% add-on payment. The phase two of this model seeks to test value-based purchasing tools in combination with that add-on adjustment from phase one. Now phase one, Medicare anticipates to be budget neutral, really in terms of a reallocation of funding, as we'll discuss in a minute, between different types of providers and different settings of care. Phase two is expected to result in savings. However, CMS has not been able to articulate the magnitude of those savings because it's still in the early stages of soliciting feedback in terms of the various value-based tools that may be implemented. The model is expected to run for five years with both phases in full operation in the last three years, and Medicare is accepting comments on the proposal until May 9th. As we start digging into the two phases of the model and how CMS plans to, to test this across both phases, CMS is seeking to adjust the add-on payment. So in phase one, the control arm will be the current status quo reimbursement, the ASP plus 6%. The test arm will be established as an ASP plus 2.5% plus a $16.80 add-on payment. The flat fee that's add-on that is, is derived from utilizing the calendar year 2014 claims and does not account for the sequester, a 2% flat reduction that was implemented as part of budgetary constraints. So as we take a look at this payment reduction, if we add the impact of sequester, really what we're seeing here is an ASP plus 0.86% payment plus $16.53 for providers. So a little less than originally anticipated and proposed. So it's important to keep in mind that the proposal does not account for that sequestration and additional payment reduction that providers will face. If so we look at phase two, we're going to see Medicare start to add in value-based payment adjustments 
So you are going to continue to see a control arm, so some providers who continue under the current ASP plus 6, and then those that will see the ASP plus 2.5% plus the $16 add-on payment, and then similar test arms that are also going to be testing value-based payment tools. And really here, CMS is trying to better understand how the change in reimbursement incentives may change behaviors. As we look to the next slide, it's also important to understand the types of products that are going to be included within the model. CMS, with limited exception, plans to include all drugs and biologicals that are paid under Part B, and this also includes biosimilars and may provide the um, change in the statutorily required payment for biosimilars to be adjusted based on the, the testing within the different arms of the study. CMS is excluding a limited number of Part B drugs that are not appropriate uh, for inclusion within the model. These are products that include some drugs that are contractor priced. This also includes vaccines, drugs that are infused through uh, durable medical equipment, ESRD drugs or end-stage renal disease drugs, as many of these products are already subject to bundled payments through Medicare's ESRD prospective payment system, certain blood and blood products, and those products that are reported to be in short supply for, uh, by the FDA. CMS, of course, is seeking comments on uh, these drug exclusions and whether there are any additional uh, adjustments that could be made. But there's also discussion around the various forms in which the payments may be adjusted as well. So CMS is interested in feedback as to whether there is an opportunity to change the ASP plus percentage or the add-on payment. As we look to the impact on patients and providers, there is um, an important discussion to understand in terms of how beneficiaries will be affected particularly as it relates to provider designation within a test arm or within a control arm, particularly in phase one. And as I mentioned earlier, the Part B demonstration is mandatory for all providers that are furnishing Part B drugs. And essentially, CMS will be making assignment within either test or control arms based on the PCSA, or the Primary Care Service Area designation. This is important because this is a geographic um, area that is defined based on the patterns specifically for primary care providers. And CMS will identify PCSAs, stratify them based on Medicare, the number of Medicare beneficiaries as well as Medicare beneficiaries spent within a PCSA. So trying to understand and sort of stratify in terms of typical spend and typical volume of Medicare beneficiaries. And then based on that PCA designation, CMS would, in theory, put 50% of PCSAs in a test arm, 50% in a control arm. And then as we move into phase two, then you would see a similar distribution across those stratified PCSAs. I think the important piece here for, for providers as well as patients is that while CMS believes the PCSA geographic designation is broad enough to allow for multiple locations within a practice to be included in one PCSA or one geography, there is likely to be circumstances in which one provider or one um, provider entity has locations in different PCSAs, which could mean being in different arms of the study. So this may create potentially some incentive to push patients and care delivery into a different PCSA if it's more advantageous. So for example, if you have one location that's in a PCSA that's part of the, the test group, so they're seeing a reimbursement reduction for drugs going to that ASP plus 2.5% plus the $16 or so add-on payment, providers in that location may be motivated to transition patients to a location that's in the PCSA that's part of the control arm. So it's not likely to be widespread, but I would find that it would be important to think through what does this mean for providers, but also what does this mean for patients, particularly if, if they end up in, in borderline PCSA areas. On the next slide, we wanted to flag for you the impact of the change in reimbursement for drugs, not only on providers, but also on patients. So as Avalier has been examining the impact 
of this payment proposal. We've been taking a look at what is the break-even point in which a practice that's in a test arm of the model is not experiencing a change in total payment. So that means as we're looking at an ASP plus 6% world, where is it budget neutral for the practice or revenue neutral for the practice between an ASP plus 6 world versus an ASP plus 2.5% and the $16 add-on payment. And that tipping point is when you have a product whose ASP is about $480. Really at that point, as you're looking at the test arm and the control arm, that's really the neutral point. But what we do find is that when you're looking at the test arm, providers' total payments will increase as you see the utilization of drugs who have an ASP lower than $480 and you see providers' total payments start to decrease as the ASP goes above $480. And this is really a dynamic between the shift in that ASP, that add-on percentage, the 2.5% plus the $16.80 add-on payment becomes financially beneficial for a lower cost product that was initially simply seeing an ASP plus 6% reimbursement. And as you can imagine, as the higher cost the drug goes, the less the provider is actually going to be reimbursed because that $1,680 in the add-on payment does not offset the overall reduction in payment that is related to dropping the plus 6 to a plus 2.5%. And as we think about the impact on provider reimbursement, it's important to understand that Medicare is not proposing to modify the 20% cost-sharing responsibility in Phase 1 of this model to patients. So you are going to see patients who may see a decrease in their out-of-pocket costs, but you're also going to see some patients see an increase in their out-of-pocket costs. And the magnitude of impact, of course, is going to vary based on the expense of the drug. Within the proposal, CMS has done an assessment in terms of the impact that the proposal would have in phase one on specialties as well as hospitals. As you can see in this chart here, CMS is anticipating that the model may shift reimbursement from hospitals and specialties that rely on higher cost drugs to specialties with more opportunity to use lower cost drugs, such as primary care or pain management. So as we look at this impact table here, you can see if we look towards the total drug payment column in that last column as we think about the physician specialty change. For hematology oncologists, we're seeing a reduction of 0.6%. But if we're looking at pain management, we're seeing an increase in reimbursement and drug, total drug payment of 44.5%. That is quite a significant increase for one specialty. And what might not seem as a significant decrease for hematology oncology, that half percentage point can be um, quite influential on certain providers, particularly community providers who may not be able to sustain that payment reduction in aggregate. It's also important to understand the, uh, the overall impact that providers may face as they see this reduction in reimbursement. It's unclear whether this impact would be enough to adjust provider referral patterns, whether community providers would seek to shift care to hospital outpatient departments, but there may be some disruptions in care delivery. It may also encourage providers who are already functioning with very small margins, particularly community providers, to eliminate certain uh, unpaid services or ancillary services, such as psychosocial screening, which may not be readily reimbursed. So I do think it's important to assess whether providers have enough time based on the aggressive timeline that CMS has proposed to really adjust to this type of a financial impact. And it's going to be an area, this is going to be an area of a concern um, for providers, but I do think that it is an area of concern for patients, particularly in certain locations. If we think about phase two, as I mentioned before, CMS is anticipating that phase one will be budget neutral and there is going to be this redistribution of reimbursement um, and this redistribution of out-of-pocket costs. In phase two, CMS is anticipating that there will be savings established. 
And these savings, while CMS is not able to articulate them, are going to be driven by the types of value-based payment tools that are implemented and tested. Now, CMS in the proposal identifies a range of different options and notes that many of them have been proven to be successful or shown to show cost reductions um, in commercial settings while improving outcomes. I think it's important to note that some of these concepts, such as outcomes-based risk agreements or indication-based pricing, are still in early stages of payment. So if we walk through this list very briefly, reference pricing is one proposal. In reference pricing, CMS would set a benchmark rate within a class of drugs or drugs that are viewed to be therapeutically equivalent. The difference here from the commercial market is where, where reference pricing has gained increasing momentum in recent years is that in the commercial sector when uh, a payer establishes a reference price point, a patient can choose to take a product at a higher price point and pay the difference. Within the Medicare program here, balance billing will not be allowed. So whatever CMS is establishing as the reference price for a particular product or class of products becomes essentially the de facto price that gets paid with little opportunity for change. Indication-based pricing is one in which prices adjust based on safety and cost effectiveness and may be driven by reports from different health technology assessments such as ICER or the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, which we'll talk about a bit later. So this is, again, based on a decision or, or perspective in terms of the safety and cost effectiveness of a particular product. Um, again, we talked about CMS proposes outcomes-based risk-sharing agreements. These are agreements that would allow the agency to enter into a specific contract with a manufacturer based on outcomes or response to a particular therapy. CMS also notes that there may be discounting or elimination of patient co-insurance within the, the phase two of the model, which may increase focus or use on certain high value drugs, which may be beneficial to certain patients, but then may also incentivize care towards these products, which um, are being deemed as having that higher value. And we really start to see here the focus on value and what is the definition of value and how is the patient voice influencing those decisions from a policy and a payment perspective. Within the phase two, CMS also discusses the development of a clinical decision support tool. While the support tool is not aimed to be uh, or replace the clinical decision making or medical judgment of a provider, um, it does provide um, a resource to clinicians in their prescribing patterns or their prescribing choices. And we can talk more about that because I do think it's important to note that while this may not be a mandatory tool, while this is not a required resource that a provider has to use when making their clinical decisions, it is definitely one that could influence practice patterns and perceptions around value of particular treatments. And it does beg the question again in terms of where is the patient voice in determining value and preference in treatment. CMS notes that with the clinical decision support tool, they are going to include decision making for prescribing drugs. They'll examine prescribing patterns, information on standardized drugs and tests that are ordered. Uh, and the potential benefits that are identified include improving patient safety and quality of care, reducing the risk of toxic drug levels, and then also using a hierarchy of evidence that is very similar in other areas of CMS programs, such as those that are used for, for the MedCAC and the like. There's definitely opportunity here for improvement in patient outcomes and care delivery, um, but there's also concerns in terms of the, the patient voice in making those decisions as to what clinical attributes or treatment preferences are a priority for an individual patient. CMS does note that they are seeking comments on transparency as to how the CDS or clinical decision tool is developed, but they also note that the tool will not be publicly accessible, um, but will be available for, for providers as a resource. And really, as we think about the various phases we've talked about, the patient voice and the priority 
in terms of ensuring, one, that they have continued access, but two, also have a perspective in making these value determinations is critical. While phase one of the proposal is really a payment reduction, one of the questions that I would raise is, are the current safety nets or quality measures that are established within the program sufficient enough to ensure that patient care is not stinted? So with many of the other CMMI proposals or demonstrations, there's usually an expansion of particular measures to ensure that care continues to be preserved for patients. Within phase one of this demonstration, CMS has not noted any additions or adjustments which is interesting because it goes then to posit to say that the current measures are sufficient to establish uh, those patient outcomes and safety nets. But as many of you know, there is a very, there's a lack of measures that are appropriate for most specialties, particularly oncology care. And so it's unclear whether the existing measures will be sufficient to make sure that patients continue to get the appropriate level of care needed. Now, Medicare does note that in the phase two programs, the value-based payment programs, that there will be a prepayment um, appeals process in which a provider and a beneficiary can seek to get um, payment adjusted for a particular treatment or drug. But again, it's unclear as to how that will truly influence patient voice or patient selection in those treatment options. It's also unclear in CMS's proposal as to the patient voice in the evaluation of the program. And the speed at which CMS could potentially implement phase one and then move into phase two may not allow for full evaluation of um, providers or patients as they go through the different components of the demonstration. So with that, I'm gonna have my colleague Josh jump in and talk in more detail about the importance of getting value right and critical, how critical it is for patients. Yeah, thanks, Fazi. Um, you know, I think that's a really interesting question to start us off with, really, the, the issue of how do we make sure that value is measured appropriately for patients, and how do we understand what outcomes really matter to them? Uh, you mentioned the lack of good quality measures in the oncology space. That's obviously a really important issue. I think putting it into some context, you know, CMS has definitely signaled its desire to create more patient-reported outcome measures. One of the really interesting pieces of its first mandatory program, the first time it moved a demonstration program to a mandatory program, which just got uh, formally implemented last week, the Comprehensive Care for Joint Replacement Program, which is hip and knee replacement, and, they, and for one out of every five hospitals, that is now a mandatory program. One of the things that they did is they actually provide an incentive for providers to voluntarily report to patient report outcome measures, right? They know that what really matters to patients after they get a hip or knee replacement is, you know, can I walk again? Can I function my daily life? So they provide an incentive for, for hospitals to report those measures as a way of trying to advance those kinds of measures. So that'll be really important. And so, um, you know, looking at this slide, when we're talking about things that matter to patients, um, particularly in the oncology space, you know, it is really important that whatever is done here really does increase shared decision making. That is, uh, you know, people who are facing decisions around their own care for cancer and the care of their own family members really are going to need information that is personalized to their particular needs. And so I think that's one of the really fundamental pieces of this. We also know that in general that people who are more engaged in their care are much more likely to manage it better, to be actively engaged in their uh, in the uh, ongoing management of it, to be uh, to adhere to their medications, uh, particularly if they are engaged in the process of developing that treatment regimen, um, and really to have confidence and, and self-efficacy with respect to um, their treatment. So I think that's a really important context. Um, when Fozzie was mentioning the clinical decision support tool, one of the things that CMS referenced um, did not talk a lot about was ICER. ICER is an organization that uh, was one of four organizations that released value frameworks in 2015. So ICER, um, ASCO, the 
American Society for Clinical Oncology, uh, NCCN, and um, MSK, the Memorial Sloan Kettering, released their drug, drug abacus. So there were these four different tools that released. Um, ICER was the only one that was mentioned by CMS. I don't think there's uh, any reason to believe that they wouldn't consider different kinds of value frameworks, but I think it's important to understand them. Um, I will go through a little bit about how one might think about ICER's value framework from the patient perspective. Um, this relates to some work that Avalier did with Faster Cures, and in fact, uh, just yesterday, uh, uh, we and Faster Cures released on the Faster Cures website a, uh, a summary and an action plan for how to move forward in a patient perspective value framework, um, and that is available through a link from our, our website or directly to Faster Cures site. Um, and we'd be happy to provide more information. Um, I won't go through all four frameworks, but I will talk about the principles that we applied to the ICER framework and, and talk about the, the process there. So, um, you know, first I think it's important to understand that ICER had these three different components. So one is around care value, the other is thinking about it in the context of overall global spending, and then thinking about sort of a provisional health system value. So it's breaking those things apart. You know, the first piece is um, the care value. Um, that is really four components. So it's, it's understanding the comparative clinical effectiveness. Um, the, the second piece is coming up with incremental cost per outcomes achieved. And for this, they do use a, uh, they, they do consider sort of the patient view on that by understanding uh, cost per quality adjusted life year. So they are using qualities as a measure of, of that um, outcome achieved. Um, then they do uh, talk about the benefits or disadvantages, um, so kind of thinking about what methods may uh, improve uh, or discourage adherence. And then finally, some contextual considerations, sort of ethical, legal, and other issues that could be important. But then they put that in the context of the second criterion, and that is the therapy's potential budget impact. And so this is actually taking something away from the individual perspective and putting it into a global perspective. And I think that's very important from a societal standpoint, but it's not very meaningful to the individual patient, right? So it, it doesn't really help us to understand when an individual person and their family are facing a decision, how do they want to think about this? So I think that's an important um, piece of this framework that's a little bit different than some others. And then finally, um, they put a, uh, an interventions uh, pr pr provisional health system value. They, they calculate that um, based on whether it could treat a population with a reasonable long-term value and with short-term costs that do not exceed the growth in the national economy. And so again, that is a very different kind of framework than most patients would think about it. And um, when obviously when CMS is balancing this, they do have to think about the individual in the context of society, but that's something that's important to consider. And that comes up with this, this value-based price benchmark. So how did we think about this? We actually came up with six criteria that we evaluated all four of these frameworks by. Um, you know, the first is really, how do you think about the value to the individual patient? And, and for this, you know, you really have to unpack um, I mentioned qualities or quality adjusted life years is, is certainly one important measure. Um, and I think, you know, when you think about the different kinds of measures that you could use in oncology, um, it, it is important to consider a range of them. So, for example, ASCO just uses survival. Um, and while survival is very important, um, it is not necessarily the most important, you know. And I think about my, my own aunt's experience and how when she was uh, dying of breast cancer, her feelings about her treatment changed very much. You know, when she wanted to get to that second Saturday in May to see her son's bar mitzvah, it was all about survival. And when she got past that point, her priorities changed a lot. In fact, they changed completely, and it became much more about humiliation and uh, living peacefully and uh, you know, doing her best to enjoy her family and what she knew was going to be uh, the end of her life. And I think we need to make sure that we are considering how patients uh, differ and how they may even differ within their own lifespan around how they think about these kinds of uh, these kinds of value. Um, and I think that you know the the next piece is uh, you know 
value frameworks are generally looking at things at, at overall, that, uh, overall cost, um, which is very different than the individual cost per patient, and what are their out-of-pocket costs. And I think we need to make sure that we're um, understanding how this affects the individual because uh, financial distress is a really serious issue that affects patients' ability to manage their own care, and we need to consider how that is playing out. Strength of evidence is important to patients mostly because it relates to how much confidence they can have in the purported uh, benefits of a given therapy, right? That, that some therapies may show great promise, but if the evidence isn't very strong, it may not yet be something that a patient can say, okay, I really know that that's going to produce the results that, that, that the therapy expects it to. Um, shared decision-making, I think I already stressed, but, you know, Individual values and preference are absolutely essential to consider, and we have to think about how to make sure that any kind of value framework puts things in a way that clinicians and patients can consider the information together around their own values and preferences. And so it, it's going to be unlikely that a value framework could produce a single number or a single score that could be useful for everybody. It needs to be put into some context. Ash, can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. So in, in your research and your expertise within value frameworks, do you think that the use of these frameworks and the different attributes that you've identified here, could that really limit that patient to provider conversation around their personal preferences? Well, I think if, if done right, they can really support it. And, you know, obviously when you think about cl clinical decision support tools like what's being considered for phase two, um, it, has a, it has the potential to be very supportive. Um, the question is, how is it deployed, um, and how is it integrated into the clinical workflow? Mm -hmm. And the sort of fist box, you know, what is the way that that information can, can be conveyed to patients mm -hmm. and their families in a way that is useful for them? Um, you know, that, that the information that is conveyed to clinicians may need to be different from the information con uh, conveyed to families. Um, in, in terms of the way it's presented or the, the kinds of, um, you know, just sort of understanding how people, different people react to different information. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a key point here, particularly as we think about how many physicians do not talk about the cost of a treatment or the cost burden with patients and how challenging that becomes. And then we're adding on to that is a value framework that's making a cost um, decision to the system versus to the patient. Yeah. So um, as we, you know, to move on with, the, I think that there are a lot of questions that remain unanswered, and I think as the, um, as, as we move through the process of this demonstration, and ultimately, in particular, into the second phase, we'll really want to understand how these, how this really affects individual patients in the context of managing their own care. So. Um, you know, the first issue is to what extent does it have an impact on how patients uh, access their providers, which, which providers they see, um, and their, their ability to have uh, discretion in that. Um, it could have an impact in care delivery, and of course, you know, as I was saying with clinical decision support, a lot of it is really how that CDS tool is used. Um, CDS can be a very valuable uh, guidepost. It can be really important in creating some structure for how to think about things and for um, providing reminders to clinicians about the kinds of things that they need to consider in their context with patients. On the other hand, it can also be a barrier, and so we need to make sure that, um, that those kinds of things are used appropriately. Um, you know, it's important that uh, we consider autonomy, both in terms of the clinicians and the uh, patients, in terms of how they access their, their treatments. Um, what are the impacts on out-of-pocket costs for individual beneficiaries? And then I think this fifth point is really one of the most important, which is, you know, the, the frameworks that were developed, uh, have been developed to date, have had a fairly limited amount of patient input into the process. And, you know, we need to make sure that patient uh, input is fully integrated into the, into the development of these tools and not only sort of as a reaction to what's being done. Um, I think that is in part the reason that Avalanche Faster Cure has felt the need to, to develop a patient perspective value framework, um, and I think it's something that we believe is going to be really important 
not only for, for this um, particular demo, but really for much of the payment and delivery innovation that's moving forward. And then finally, the issues around quality measures are really important. Um, we need to come up with measures that really matter to patients. Um, we need to come up with things that make a difference in how they think about their selection of providers, their selection of, uh, of health plans, their uh, uh, understanding of different treatment options, and uh, we can't do that if we don't, again, integrate them into the development, the measure development process. I think that's important because as phase one is applicable to all Part B drugs, CMS, as I mentioned earlier, does not identify a new or subset of measures that will be tested in that phase. But as we think about the movement into phase two, should CMS get to that point, then we are talking about becoming either drug-specific or potentially disease-specific in nature. And that's really where the measures um, become even more important as we think about how they're developed and tested within those different pilots. Yeah, I think it's always going to be a balance, you know, that, that there's a need to understand, um, particularly for people with very serious conditions, right? That when we're talking about measures that matter to patients, if you are a patient with a specific cancer, um, there's you know, largely one thing that matters to you. Um, but in, in other conditions, there obviously is a concern around um, you know, taking, looking at, at diseases rather than looking at people. And we need to make sure that, you know, as, as you know, Don Burke would say, that we're thinking about you know, uh, whole person measures, that we're thinking about measures that, that understand a person's whole care and, and ensures continuity and, and uh, coordination acro across the continuum of care. I'll also add that in CMS's proposal, as we think about the evaluation criteria that will be used, CMS notes that they're going to be examining historical patterns of Part B drug use and Medicare costs, and they do say health outcomes for Benny's, but as we talked about, they don't have additional specificity, which leads us to believe that the current measures would be sufficient. CMS does note that they may, may consider a survey of beneficiaries and providers. Um, but again, doesn't note that as a mandatory part of their evaluation process. I think that's another area for advocates to really think about, which is what is the patient perspective in terms of uh, this specific program. Of course, patient perspective and experience may get captured within other alternative payment models that may be tested within a particular geography because CMS does plan on um, including entities that are part of ACOs or accountable care organizations and patient-centered medical homes as part of the overall initiative. So there may be ways there, um, but they're not um, specified otherwise. And, and so, Josh, maybe we can talk about briefly um, how this is a very different approach to alternative payment model testing by CMMI than the historical landscape which has been, as we've seen over the years, to, to do a smaller geographic voluntary testing of a model before expanding it more broadly and making it mandatory. We've seen with an April 1st implementation date of the Comprehensive Joint Replacement Program, it's sort of being the first mandatory program, but it's based off of research and data that has been established through many, many, many previous programs. Yeah, so I think that CMS has looked at this as, uh, you know, as you mentioned in the episodes of care uh, models, they basically have said, okay, we, we've tested out um, this program with 48 different conditions. We're going to take, we're going to start with hip and knee replacement and create a mandatory program around that now that we understand something about the program. Um, there are certainly, uh, and that, that of course is on a national basis. Um, and has been at the beginning from voluntary and now moving to, to mandatory. On the, uh, in some cases what it does is it does go more geographic by giving states an opportunity to implement their own programs. Mm -hmm. So through things like the state innovation models or SIM grants, they have provided states with the authority and the ability to test out models on their own. Um, and then of course giving the states a lot of flexibility as to sort of how they compel um, providers in, in, the, uh, in, the, in those demonstration programs. Um, but this, yeah, this is really interesting. This is definitely, um, they're obviously trying to address some big issues that CMS is facing in terms of um, how um, costs are, are changing in, in uh, the Medicare program and trying to address something that they haven't had a lot of uh, success in controlling before. 
I think it also raises some questions in terms of how beneficiaries will be notified as to which arm of the study their provider is in. Are they in a control arm? Are they in a test arm? What could be driving changes in their clinical behaviors? You know, with many of the, you know, other programs, particularly I'm thinking about the accountable care organization programs or ACOs, you know, there was a requirement that ACOs had to do that outreach to patients to let them know that they were participating in an ACO. I don't think it's very clear in the proposal um, how transparent providers will, will be or will be required to be with their patients so that they can understand what these changing dynamics are. Mm -hmm. So patients should expect that they, will, they may not know whether they're in a test arm or a I don't think so, yeah. CMS was not very specific in, in the rule. We can always right. go back and double check, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of detail in terms of beneficiary communication mm -hmm. so that they can understand what changes are happening or what could be influencing or incentivizing certain provider behaviors. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to encourage you, this has been a great a great conversation and, again, a lot of detail. Um, I'm going to encourage you, if you have questions, to please type those in on the bottom right side of your screen. We are going to go through a couple that we have received through the course of the talk today. Um, the first one is around um, the, the determination of a provider going into either a test arm or a control arm. And the question is, is will that decision be made by their registered billing address or by their actual service address? Yep, that's a, that is a great question. So that assignment is going to be based on the zip code of the billing or performing NPI or provider identifier that's on the claim. So it will go back to the zip code of potentially the, the corporate entity. Like the, I always like to say the mothership if you have multiple prongs within your practice. Um, and for hospital outpatient department, it's also to the zip code of the CMS uh, certified number that's associated with that particular hospital. Great. So it is going to be based off of zip code. Okay. Zip code of the billers. Yep. Of the billing address. Great. And then we had a question around patient out-of-pocket costs. Yep. And in one of your early slides, you mentioned $480 as the break-even point. Yep. Um, less than $480 would um, show an increase in patient out-of-pocket costs. Above 480 would show a decrease in patient out-of-pocket costs. And the question was raised that if the same 20% copay exists, how does that, how does that um, work out? Sure. So maybe if we do like a quick e example. I'm always the worst with math, so we'll try to keep it simple. But if you're thinking about a drug that has an ASP of $100, if you're thinking about that reimbursement rate under the current payment system, it would be an ASP plus 6% which means that the reimbursement rate for that drug would be, in totality, $106. So the Benny is going to be responsible for 20% of $106. When we take a look at the, the change here in, with the, the test model, you're looking at that reimbursement rate for that $100 drug, the ASP of a $100 product, changes based on that 2.5%, as well as the add-on payment of $16.80, that total payment now for that product becomes $119.30. So you can see there where with that add-on payment, that creates in totality a higher payment for that same drug at that ASP plus 6%. So you're talking about shifting from 20% to $106 drug, 20% to about $119, $120. So that's really where you start to see the, the shift in, in patient cost sharing. So it is the dynamic between that percent add-on plus the flat fee. That's really the driver there. And we're comparing it to current day versus one, one end or the other. That is correct, because currently in phase one, you're just looking at the control group as being ASP plus 6%. And then you're looking at the control group as being that two point ASP plus two point five percent plus the add on payment. Okay. So it's important to remember here that the patient cost sharing is on the total payment for the drugs. It's not just the ASP, so it's not twenty percent of the ASP, which in our example would be that hundred dollars. It is a total payment of ASP plus six percent versus ASP plus two point five percent plus the add on payment. Talk about Great. complex math. <laughs> Great. And I'm just pausing for a moment to take a look at the questions that are that are 
coming in. Um, we have some questions that are, are, I would qualify as around the advocacy perspective, right? So, you know, somebody raised the question of, you know, should some of these transparencies and the patient considerations and all be mandated even before the study begins? So I'll just comment on that to say um, I, I know from a CSC perspective we will be making comments to this proposed rule, and that will be a part of our comments is that there are certain requirements before CMS would be allowed to move forward with uh, with the, the, the proposed rule, and, the, and both of those would be would be one of those. Um, so I will, you know, just mention to you that as a as a concerned advocate, we would encourage you to um, to, to, to to stay close to the groups with whom you work and be a part of their process for submitting. Also, feel free to um, submit questions and comments of your own as this, this process moves forward, and we can be a, certainly be a, a help to you around around that. Yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. Um, as someone who used to review comments at HHS, um, you know, th those kinds of things I think uh, HHS would likely be very responsive to in terms of um, how to engage, how to ensure engagement of patients and patient advocacy communities. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So we have a question around um, how will personalized or precision medicine be impacted by this ruling? Um, there may not be data for a specific drug for your cancer, but data on the mutation treated would be available. I mean, I would say that a few things. So one is that, um, you know, just talking about the need to think about clinical decision support tools that can reflect yep. the individual circumstances of individual people. and. Um, making sure that we don't think about you know, sort of single numbers or single um, uh, approaches that are going to work for, for every person. So I think that's, that's the first piece of it. I think the second piece of it is understanding how uh, newer data can be incorporated into models. And you know, some models, um, you know, uh, some frameworks have really relied almost exclusively on clinical trial data, um, and that isn't always um, Often not the most up-to-date available. That's the most up-to-date data that's available. Um, you know, you think about how um, the ability to get rapid, real-world learning into um, the understanding of the value of different treatments now is so different than it once was. You know, we have. If you think about a, a place like Kaiser Permanente, um, you know, there's 10 million members across the country, uh, a full clinical electronic health record. They actually have more. Um, patients with cancer or who are survivors of cancer than all of the clinical trials around the country combined. And so you think about how powerful that is to understand the impact of different treatments on different kinds of populations when they have all of that uh, demographic information. Um, that's obviously a piece of understanding that. Now, obviously, when you get into precision medicine, you start getting to a whole different level of granularity, but I think all of those things are really important in terms of understanding the use of of real-world data and real-world evidence in guiding future decision-making. Mm -hmm. And we have one question that, um, that, that, that speaks to, I want to say, patients, patient empowerment or patient yeah. being fully informed of their treatment options and being allowed to make a decision that's um, important to them. And, um, the, you know, the question is around how do patients really get a full picture of their risk-benefit profile, whether it be the outcome of their treatment or whether it be the financial toxicity um, or uh, their ability to pay, pay for treatment. And again, speaking to what CSC's comments will be, when we're looking at the shared decision tool, currently the way that I read the rule, this shared decision tool focuses a lot on scientific data, right? Medical, scientific, clinical trial type data. It really doesn't get into the psychosocial type learning that we learn and know a lot about influencing um, treatment decisions and patient experience. Um, so we will comment as a part of our rule that that shared decision making tool has to be created with the input of patients. It has to be adequately tested. We have over $2 million invested in a treatment decision counseling tool called Open to Options that we use regularly and available to anyone on the phone if you're interested in, in utilizing that service. Um, but we feel like that same level of rigor and full information needs to be also applied to certainly a tool that would be coming out of the federal government reaching so many patients. Um, across the United States. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's critically important. Yeah, I think it's I think it's very important. I mean, even within the phase one, we're talking about trying to assess the impact of payment reduction and how that may change behaviors. But moving into phase two, and if we do see CMS move forward, 
with reference pricing or indication-based pricing, you know, there is like from a patient perspective sort of an implicit, you know, gold star on what is being determined by an entity such as CMS in informing their decision making. They may not feel that they are empowered or educated enough to sort of push back and have their voice reflected in that decision making. I think there's a lot of complexities here in terms of how these programs can be developed and implemented. And it does raise the question as to is this moving too fast and do we need to take a step back and maybe do some additional research or focus in key areas prior to implementation at a national mandatory level. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. So again, stay tuned and, and feel free to, to join us in our efforts to uh, raise, raise your voice around that. Um, we did have a question around shifting sites of care. Mm -hmm. And the question was, and, and we've heard this since MMA was first in, introduced in what, 2002 or 2003. Yes. And, you know, the idea that if you decrease reimbursement for um, the physician service fees, mm -hmm. will patients then be shifted to inpatient, you know, or hospital based settings? And, um, you know, the question was specifically do we have evidence? to prove that the higher out-of-pocket costs exist in these settings. But I'm wondering what your thoughts are in general about if there is shifting to those particular settings, what happens to overall costs, what happens to patient costs, what does patient experience look like? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really great question. So there, there is data about shifts in, in care delivery patterns from physician outpatient to hospital outpatient departments over the years. Now the, the reasons behind that are, are very complicated and are often reflective of a number of different factors. Um, but as we think about the, the impact on the system as well as patient out-of-pocket costs, um, there, there is data that shows the, specifically for Medicare, the reimbursement differential for community physician care versus hospital outpatient department, where hospital outpatient department care can oftentimes be at a higher cost and therefore at a higher um, impact on patient out-of-pocket um, reimbursement. Of course, there are other policies in play here that would seek to um, align or cap reimbursement um, in the physician payment as well as the hospital outpatient department setting of care, so neutralizing those reimbursement um, differentials. But I do think that more importantly to me, it is about a disruption in care delivery, so where patients may not be able to access care in their traditional community setting. I, I do think that that's a, that's a concern that as a patient um, I, would, I would be thinking about. Great. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up our time here today. This has been a fantastic conversation, so thanks to both of you and I know for your team at Avalier who's done so much work to help prepare all of us for, for this call. Um, we have a slide that has everyone's contact information um, available to them that we'll be able to post on the screen or we'll make sure, there you go, I would say, or we'll provide it for you after the fact. So there you have everyone's information. Please feel free, feel free to reach out to any of us if we can help um, support you, answer any additional questions. I will offer up a couple of resources from the cancer support community. Um, number one, our telephone helpline. It's offered free to patients. That number is 888-793. 9355. We do also have a network of affiliates where patients are more than welcome to go and, um, and talk with our folks as they are going through, um, through this particular decision-making process. And that network of affiliates, you can get to them through our helpline or through our, um, through our website. So just in summary, I do want to say a couple of things, particularly to the patients and patient advocates who are listening today on this call or, or on this webinar or might be listening after the fact. You know, as I listen and read the proposed rule, number one, patients will be impacted, right? And I use the word patients representative of the entire family unit. So one way or the other, they will be impacted by this particular proposed rule, whether it is being um, assigned a reference arm that may not be applicable to your particular situation, whether it might be a change in your out-of-pocket costs, whether it might be a shift in your care delivery site. There are a number of ways in which you as a patient or a family may be impacted. So it's, it's important for you to be aware and be participating in this particular conversation now. Um, I do feel like we have the opportunity to partner together across 
the healthcare industry and across the policymakers to help elevate the patient voice so that when we are talking about what is going to be a transformation, and as we saw, Fazia, in your earlier slides, we are moving to a different payment strategy. We, it's, it's inevitable, so we can either be a part of that conversation or continue to resist it. But in being a part of that conversation, how do we make sure to raise our voices such that we are really advocating for comprehensive quality cancer care that is inclusive of psychosocial support, nutritional support, sexuality, fertility, all of those things that may not be thought about when you're thinking about just infusion chemotherapy or giving, um, giving IV treatments. So it's really important for us to, to be a part of this conversation. Um, it's also a part, it's, it's also very important, I think, for patients to become a self-advocate. And what I mean by that is we've heard today that you may or may not know if you're part of one of the trial arms or whether you're part of the control arm. So I think it's really important for you to sit down and have that conversation with your healthcare team. Make sure that you know the full spectrum of your risk and benefits before you agree to move forward with your treatment plan so that you then know which is the right step to take for you. I would again offer services like we have, treatment decision counseling models and some of our partner advocacy organizations free of charge to patients to, to, to just sort of step back a minute and listen to what you've heard from your healthcare team, come back, have a conversation with another um, neutral party and then go back in and have a, a, a further conversation with your, with your healthcare team. So now is, a, is the time for you to be a self-advocate, and then also be an advocate within the broader process. So we will be submitting comments on this particular proposed rule. I know that some of our fellow advocacy organizations will be making comments on this proposed rule. We would encourage you to write your own letters um, sharing your thoughts with CMS, and we're happy to provide contact information and share with you ways in which you, uh, which you can do that. So with that, I think that I will close. For those of you who hear the sirens here in Washington, D.C., we are, in fact, okay. They just happen to be driving down the street. Um, but I'll thank all of you for joining us today, and we will look forward to communicating with you on this particular issue moving forward. Thank you so much.